Example. He's a living example for you and for me. And so it's, it's neat because when we look at the Word of God and the example that Jesus has given us, it transcends time. It transcends all time. Yeah, we're living in a day you know, of, of iPods and BFF and Facebook and all these different things, but those life to life that Jesus lived, even though it was 2,000 years ago, still is just as relevant today in our lives by the examples that he leaves us. And I want you to notice what we see Jesus doing, because a lot of times I think as, as Christians, we, we're, we fail a little bit in this area. Because we kind of keep, what I say, we keep the church within the four walls. Here. And yet, when you read Acts 10, verse 38, it says, well, Jesus went about doing good. And I think sometimes it's hard for us to go out and, and do that good. Yeah, it's easy for us to do it to one another. Right? But it's a little more difficult to take Jesus from here to out there. As the writer says, outside of the camp. But that's what we see Jesus doing. He's healing. He's healing the paralytic. So we see in Matthew chapter 9 and in verse 2 and 3, that talks about he's coming to the city after he gets out of the boat. And there's a paralytic there. And he sees the person's faith and he says to the paralytic, take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. Of course, the, the paralytic then is healed. Now, what is interesting is that when we see Jesus going around in his life, and he's giving us an example, and I want you to notice this example here. And I want you to notice that he's going around and he's doing good. And I want you to notice the last part of that verse there says, And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. One of the things when I'm working with Christians for some reason, we forget that here's the example. Go out and do good, but you need to realize you're going to be persecuted. For some reason, we kind of have this idea that, well, you know, since we're going out and doing good, everything is just going to be wonderful. It's going to be peaches and cream all the time. And then yet, the living example that we see of the Savior, go out and do good. Oh, but by the way, you're going to be persecuted for it. The life of Jesus, the living example. See, when we talk about Christianity, it's like, am I willing to take that on? That's the example. Am I willing to take that? Am I willing to go out and do something nice for you and then have you to kick dirt in my face? To have you say bad things about me? To have you slander me? Hopefully you won't try to kill me. But that's what Jesus, that's the example that he gives us. We find him, of course, also in Matthew chapter 9. The woman who's suffering from the hemorrhaging of, of the blood. For 12 years, she's spending all her money going to every single type of doctor that there is to find no relief. And what 
she's thinking in her heart, it just amazes me. And I think it amazed Jesus too, because she's just thinking, you know what, if I can just touch the hem of this man that's passing by, I will be made whole. And I want you to notice Jesus, he tells her, take heart. He said, your faith has made you well. Jesus will often make the comment, he says, I have never seen faith like this in Israel. And a lot of times it makes me question my faith sometimes too when I just think God isn't there for a moment. Heal. Faith, where, where's, where's my faith? Jesus walks that living example. That's, that's his life. He's showing you can have faith in me. I will help. I will heal. Maybe not exactly the way that you think, but I will be there. But there's something else about Jesus as we're looking at his life. Everyone noticed that he talked like no one else had ever talked. The words that he brought, it's like, oh, those words aren't like anything that anyone else has said or the scribes have said or the Pharisees have said. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 22, it says, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as one of the scribes. Authority, power, he was walking, he was living what he was, was teaching. And it's interesting the concepts that Jesus brings because they're even hard for us sometimes to understand. It's like, love your enemies, what? Love your enemies, what? Let me ask you this question. When they caught Saddam Hussein, were you just happy and rejoicing? Yeah, that guy finally got what's coming to him. And then you realize where he's headed. Jesus says, I don't even want to wish that on my worst enemies. I have to because justice demands it. But I don't even want to wish that on my worst enemies. You know, it's hard for me to love like that. It's hard for me to love like that. Because when someone's kicking the dirt in your face and saying bad things about you, know, you just want to get even, right? You just want to take your own justice. So, oh, I don't know if I can wait. I know you say the vengeance is yours, but I don't know if I can wait that long. No one ever taught like Jesus did. He was bringing them some words. And he said to them, which one of you who has a sheep and falls into the pit on the Sabbath will not take hold of it and lift it out? He says, of how much more value is a man than a sheep? Or is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? When he said to the man, stretch out your hand, and the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the others. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. I like this verse because it relates a lot to Seattle. And you say, well, how does it relate to Seattle? And a lot of you guys know Seattle is kind of a progressive place. And so I always take this as, you know, as Jesus says, well, how much more value is a man than a sheep? Because of where we live, they won't build houses and stuff because they see one little bird that's flying around and they think that it's extinct. And so you can't build anything there for 20, 20 years. Who knows if the bird was just flying through for the day or not? How much more important is the man? And the sheep, or he said, wouldn't you even go down and pick it up if, if you saw it was your sheep in the pit? No one had ever talked like this. No one had ever brought words like this. Ancient words.
one section of Jesus' life that brings hope, hope for sin. And for this, I just want to pick out there's two individuals that I think that shows hope. But it also depends on how we respond to it. And one is the person of Judas. And we know Jesus, Judas, he was the treasurer, he was the one who, who held the money, or who took control of the money. And we know also he was the one who betrayed Jesus. But I want you to notice how he, either how he views Jesus or sees Jesus as that hope in his life for the things that he has done or not. We're told in Matthew chapter 27, and starting in verse 3, it says, Then when Jesus, Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind, and he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, well, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Take care of it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver, he departed, and he had Jesus' life is one of hope, hope for sin. Now, there's something that's going on here <coughs> with Judas that's kind of in the realm of repentance or, or turning that heart back. What Judas does, he doesn't see Jesus, he doesn't take responsibility for his wrongdoing. And the reason I have the words highlighted there in yellow, he hanged himself, is because he's avoiding the consequences. I, I, I don't want to have to deal with the consequences of knowing that I betrayed Jesus. So he takes his life into his own hand. But there's something else I want you to notice about Judas's actions there. He only changes his mind when he sees that the end result is not favorable. Did you ever notice that? It says that when he saw that Jesus was condemned, then he changed his mind. It wasn't, oh no, what have, what, what, what have I done? I, I, shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done that. It was like, oh no. It's almost like saying, well, I got caught, so now. He changes his mind only when the end result isn't favorable. So long as I get away with speeding down the street, it's okay, but if I get caught, oh. Repentance. He doesn't understand the hope that Jesus can bring. And then, of course, he's motivated by guilt. Oh, what are others going to think that I betrayed Jesus? But that's not enough. Now, I want you to take a look at another person. And a lot of times when we take a look at Peter and, and Judas, we think, oh, Judas, he was, oh, he was really bad, right? He was the worst. He betrayed Jesus. All Judas did was he went up and he, he kissed Jesus. Jesus said many times, I'm he, I'm he, I'm he. So Jesus didn't have to do anything, but he goes up and he kisses him and says, okay, yeah, that's him. And I want you to think about Peter. You've been traveling around with Peter for three years. So you know Peter, and Peter knows a little bit about you. And so then I want you to think about Peter. So now in Matthew chapter 26 and 74, and it says, and he began to invoke the curse on himself, swearing, I don't know the man, I don't know Jesus. That's just like saying you don't even exist. I've been with you for three years, but you don't even exist. You're nothing. I don't know you. Who are, who are you? It says, immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. I think Peter understands something a little bit more than Judas does just by his example. First of all, I want you to notice that he doesn't wait for the end result to exhibit his remorse. He doesn't wait like Judas, like, oh, Jesus condemned now. Oh, now I'm sorry. <sighs> Peter's like, oh, Lord, what have I done? He exhibits the remorse immediately. There's no need for him to wait to see, well, what's the end result going to be? If it's favorable, then it's okay. If not, no, I've done wrong. He's motivated by a heartfelt disappointment. I'm always fathomed when I think about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how they can be so moved by the creatures that they have created. How you can pray to the Father 
and he thinks you're so important that he'll stop the rain for three and a half years if it needs to be. And our hearts touch the heart of God. And then you notice that Peter doesn't, he doesn't avoid the responsibility. He goes out, he, he weeps bitterly, but he comes back, he's there. When Jesus is resurrected, because he understands the hope that Jesus brings through his life. Sometimes maybe in our lives we're like that. We need to realize through the life of Christ that does bring us hope. So we're going to sing number six, Forever Rain. Yo! Yeah. 